Okay, here we go. Let's get this thing started. This is the place where I get to say what I want, the way I want, and how I want. And there's nobody here to take the conversation to the right or to the left. Why? Because it's all on me. This is Express Yourself. And I'm Nate Patterson. Topic today, being a Christian. I had to think about that for a minute. We'll get to it in 60 seconds. Express yourself. Express yourself. Express yourself. You don't never need help. Hello everybody, my name is Nate Patterson and this is Express Yourself. I got a conversation, I mean I got a I got a topic right now on some things or something that I went through over the last few months trying to be a Christian man. Now I, I, I want to tell you man, Christian, being a Christian, that that term has all of a sudden over the years become a dirty turn with, with the African American community and for obvious reasons <clears throat> right um, the way that uh, Jesus was presented to the African American community the way that uh, Christianity was presented is somewhat suspect now I've been dealing with this thing for a very long time you know for a very long time and um, I've learned some things. You see, we have to go way back in history to understand why Jesus is a problem to us today. And let me clean something up. I'm not talking about the God Jesus, okay? I'm talking about the, how can I put it, the image of that God the way it was presented to us by the other demographic, right? So, long story short, when we were first kidnapped off the shores of uh, Africa, you know, and we began our journey to this land, Jesus uh, had already been introduced to our people, right? Now, our people were already worshiping their own gods. Okay, but, you know, here comes the white man, and he's introducing his god through, um, I forgot what those people are called, uh, that go out and preach Jesus to the natives and all that kind of stuff. You know, here they come. Well, see, that's warfare. That's designed warfare, right? To win the hearts and minds of the, uh, of the people. And that was a strategy and that strategy worked well, but we won't get into that strategy. That's not the purpose of my, of my show today. We'll, we'll do it some other time. But trust me, that strategy worked like clockwork. So we're on the ship, and we're in the middle plat passage, and then it began. Then it began the destruction of the me mental capacity of our people. That's when we were introduced to Jesus through pain and torture. Beatings, whippings, mutilations, all kind of stuff in order for us to forget our gods and worship Jesus. Okay, fine, that happened, right? Now, you got to understand, we weren't allowed to read. It was against the law. So we could not read the Bible. So we can only count on what they were telling us that they were beating into our ancestors, coercing them to worship this God, right? And they painted the picture the way they wanted to about that God. So fast forward 
to the future or to the present, to the present day. With hindsight, history, research, and everything else at our disposal, we uncovered all this stuff. And yet, today, we still worship the Jesus that they put before us. What you talking about, Nate? What Jesus did they put before? Jesus is God. Jesus is Jesus is that. Yeah, but Jesus is different when you actually read him for yourself. And, and, and rather than being told how he is by some other people. Now, we're going to get away from that demographic because they did their work. They did their work and they did it well. The problem today is the way Jesus is being preached. Okay? And I blame the pastors. I blame every pastor that preaches Jesus in this manner. Why? Because they had the same, um, the same, for lack of better words, the, the same, I don't know, why can't I forget, why can't I think of this word? The same, um, well, they could go back and research the same things that we did about Jesus to get an accurate picture because the Bible says get a clear and accurate knowledge of him. Well, if we listen to the other demographic, that's not clear, pure, or accurate. Not by a long shot. But our people have adopted what they taught us, mixed in some of their own stuff, and we couldn't be further away from the actual Bible, the way the, uh, we are to understand this God if we would have paid somebody to take us further away. We, I mean, it's like night and day. So this is what I'm going to talk about right now. I'm, I'm sorry for the long intro, you know, but I had to lay some groundwork because I'm going to say some things, you know. So anyways, I'm at this place. I'm at this church, and there's no need for names and all that kind of stuff because I, I, I never do names, you know. Uh, but if you really want to know, it's not hard to figure out, you know. Um, it really isn't. But in any regard, I was at this place, and they kept telling me, Brother Nate, we're different. And I, I, I got to be honest, I wasn't hearing them. Not the way, not in the manner that they meant for me to hear. I was thinking something totally different. So I got woke up to this particular place and how they worship the Most High. Now, I'm from the school that, you know, I'm not going to try to tell you what to do. But if you're doing something wrong and becoming a stumbling block for others, then I'm going to open up my mouth and tell you about it. And, and this is what I do. I, I go places and I correct. Right? Well, how can you correct anybody, Nate? Because the Holy Spirit tells me to do it. And that's, that's not a popular belief for people. People think because of the way I, I, I act, right, that it's all me. Well, it's not. And I apologize for the way that I have acted in the past because I was a very angry man. I was a very angry person on this particular subject because of what I told you in the beginning, right? But once again, time brings about change, and in time comes change. So if I've matured about a lot of things, right? And I've seen things a lot clearer. So while in this place, I, I discovered a number of things that actually were different in their beliefs. Now, I don't, I don't you know, I, I, I try not to come down on what people are believing and following, but when they affect me, or this world, I got to speak up because I am a citizen in this world and I live here. Okay? So, let's get to it. Right? I'm in this place, man, and there are three things that, that I had an issue with. Understanding. I did gain some understanding, but still, you know what I mean? I still think it's odd. And one thing, uh, I think this particular place... And I think people today take faith too far and don't really understand the way faith as, a, uh, as it relates to the Bible. Okay? Now, these people said that we get all faith at the point of salvation. Well, I disagree. 
I don't know if you agree, but let's see, right? The Bible says that you get a measure of faith, a measure. Well, all right, here's some questions. What is a measure? How much is a measure? Are all measures the same? You see what I'm saying? Because if that be true, then these people are right. But if we look closer, we'll find that in the Bible, the Bible says that different gifts require different amounts of faith. With the most general being the famous line, if he had faith of a, the size of a mustard seed. Mustard seed, the size of a mustard seed. That's not a lot of faith. But if you, the Bible says if you had that faith, you could move mountains. Now, are we talking about literal mountains? No, we're not. We're talking about the problems and issues in our lives. Right? Let's get away from the King James uh, rhetoric and let's start looking at this thing in practical application. All right? They're not talking about a real mountain, in which I thought when I first learned it. I, 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 I kid you not. I really actually thought an actual mountain was going to move, right? And then I understood that these mountains are our problems and issues of life, okay? So if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, no issue in life could bother you. Well, how is that working out for you? How is that working out for you? Because I'm going to tell you, man, I've been in this thing for 40 years, and I understand this, man. But just a little while ago, I got woke up by the most high because I have a uh, financial issue that's really stressing me out right now. And I've been on it for like about a week. I picked up my phone, and there was a message. And it said, my child, why do you worry? Am I not the God of all flesh? Is there anything too hard for me? I kid you not. I cannot find that text message on my phone anymore. And it wasn't just your normal text message. It was, in a, it was, it was like in a snapshot photo. I, my God never ceases to amaze me, man. I mean, I know people can come up with countless explanations, but you go ahead. I'm believing what I believe. Okay? So that message came right on time. Do you understand? It came right on time, and it caused me to stop stressing so much. But this is what we do as human beings. We worry about stuff. We think stuff is not going to happen. And in, 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 in a lot of us that are Christians, we always say, oh, I believe in God, and, and it's already done, and all this stuff, and then we still worry. Book of book of. Uh, yeah, the book of James said if you, if you worry or waver, don't expect nothing from the Most High, right? So, i got to wait for the noisy people to go by, all right? So, this is how we act as people, as humans, okay? So, I don't think we get the same measure of faith as individuals and enough uh, measure of faith to go on because the Bible is always encouraging, encouraging us to increase our faith. Jesus said, oh, you of little faith or small faith. You know what I mean? I mean, we're always encouraged to build our faith. So if we're given enough at the beginning, how come we can't do these things? And when that came out in the Bible study, I went against it and I was made out to be an idiot by the pastor and first lady who really who really went at that and I truly think and believe that they are wrong and they are they they don't really understand this thing but of course you know um it is what it is so secondly you know there's this other there's this other belief right there's this other belief that they cannot sin as Christians because what Jesus did on the cross is already paid for. It's already done. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Would that be the mindset and the reasoning why is not the whole world saved? See? This is the problem I got with your rhetoric. And then you will counter with 
Well, you got to, you know, be drawn by uh, the Spirit and then accept Jesus Christ. Well, fine. I believe that. You know, I'm in agreement with that. But see, here's where we part. Okay? Here's where we part. Right? You don't have access to anything that Jesus did until you enter into the kingdom and receive him as your Lord and Savior. But this is not what they're saying. And believe me, it gets muddled. We've had a bunch of back and forth. But this is what they believe, the preaching. See, it is already done, the actual uh, legwork or the actual action, right, of bringing salvation into the world. Jesus did his job, and he did it very well. Okay? But for you to partake of that, you have to join in the family. And once you get in the family, you have to remain repentant. Which brings me to another thing. They believe that you don't have to repent because, once again, it's already done. Now, personally, I think that's real selfish and ignorant and like a little spoiled little kid. Because, you know, you say that to a God, right? If you do something wrong and out of line and against what he's about, you know, you're just going to go on because Jesus paid for it. Well, let's take a look at it there, right there, before I go to where I'm going to say. Even if you think that, right? Even if you think that, don't you think it's disrespectful not to say you're sorry anyways? I mean, you do that to your mother and father. But to a God, you don't have to, so you don't. I, what kind of mindset is that? Where's the reverence? And then five minutes later, you, 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 you're throwing your hands up and looking like you're crying, but you're really not. But you look like you're crying, you, you know, and, 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 and calling Jesus' name and talking about how much you love him. Well, I can't tell from your actions. I'm wondering if he can. Because these people have done some questionable stuff and said some questionable things that they probably don't think so. But, you know, if you're on the other side, you very well think so. And, and they refuse to do what it says in the Gospels to go to your brother who you have ought with and fix it because they don't think they've done anything wrong. You see, this type of preaching ruins the mindset. It's a domino effect, and, and, and it just, it's like, it's like the leaven. Once it gets in there, it spoils the whole lump, right? Right? Because this mindset is very ignorant. To people, I've sat in that place and have been totally disrespected and no one has lifted a voice to apologize but one person. Everybody else, you know, they'll tell you, they'll argue the point. I didn't offend you. How would you know? How can you tell me you didn't offend me? But this is what they do in their love for Jesus, right? So now we're at this study. And see, I got a problem with pastors in this sense. If you're going to hold that title in that office, you better be ready for everything that comes with that title in office. I don't want you to walk around saying I'm a pastor, get a microphone in your hand and scream Jesus and, and, and think that that's it. Number one, you're supposed to have office hours to counsel, to counsel, uh, you're supposed to have office hours to counsel your saints. This particular church has no pastoral counsel hours for any counseling. I'm not even sure if they know how to do it. Because I went to them for counseling a couple of times and I didn't think they did. But that's on them because they do things different, right? But if you're going to hold that title, you need to be about that life. I'm talking about the pastor's life. So if I constantly ask you questions and your responses, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to begin to question you because the pastor is supposed to know almost everything that he can, what goes on in that particular church. But if you never know what's going on, then you got a problem, you know? And secondly, right, why are we only preaching Jesus one-dimensional? And whatever happened to Jehovah, Yahweh, Whatever happened to him? Oh, he's the same person. It doesn't sound like that the way you're talking. Because you guys have successfully taken this supposedly one entity, three people in one, and made them separate entities. But then you interchange them as you talk. So nobody knows which one you're actually talking about until you're questioned. 
So when you do that and you go back and forth, you bring you just mix all kind of stuff in to make your point. I'm not the one for that, man, because I hang on every word and I see the difference. Holy Spirit tells me all the time. All the time. So in this particular uh, situation, this pastor said something that was totally ridiculous. And I'm not going to say ridiculous to me. I'm going to say ridiculous because it is. This pastor said that the word of God does not come to the unsaved. This is what he said. I don't care in what context he was talking. That is not true. The word of God is for the unsaved. So I challenged it. And that led to a whole big issue where the deaconess of that church assaulted me, bumped me, knocked me back into some equipment. She wanted to fight. How much God you got in you? But anyways, the preaching today is suspect. It's very suspect. The preaching today has an agenda. And the agenda is of that pastor is not of God. The pastor is not the uh, final word in the church by any way, shape, or form. But most pastors today think that they own and run the church. Everything has to go by them. Everything. You come to a church with aspirations of singing in the choir, and that pastor says, no, I want you over to the ministry of health. That's where you're going. That's not God. That's that man. Right? That's that man. So in order to navigate these churches, you got to take a look at the head, and that's the pastor. As the pastor goes, there goes the church and everybody in it. This pastor said, the word of God does not come to the unsaved. You can't clean that up, no matter how many amens, hallelujahs, and, 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 and Jesus is you put in any part of your explanation. But the first lady of that particular church tried to explain it by saying you got to understand the context of what you the context of what she's saying. Do you understand the context of which he's he's talking? Because I don't think you do, first lady. You explain to me how the word of God does not come to the unsaved. So when I said that. Um, asked the pastor to explain it. The first thing out of his mouth was the famous quote that he quotes every single class about four or five times a class and about 13 times during his sermon. No man comes to the Father lest the Spirit draw him. Bam! Right there. Word of God. Right there. Word of God. Because the Spirit is the Word of God, Pastor. Did you understand that before you started off on your nonsense, first lady? Did you understand that when you came up with your nonsense? Deaconess, did you understand that when you came up with your nonsense? He was wrong. He said something very stupid. So when I challenged him, asked him to explain it, he could not. And it turned into a big deal, in which I ended up getting assaulted and called a punk because I'm the bad guy. When Christians act like that, it's not good. And you know what? That, that I got to tell you, when that happened, something inside me didn't snap, but something inside me just changed. Because I got I, I to gotta be, I gotta be honest, it bothered me for... A few days, it still bothers me today. But it calmed me down. It calmed me down. I mean, because if anybody out there knows me by right now, I would have had all kind of MFs and all kind of stuff all over this tape. It's not there. That, that anger, in that sense, is not there. Now, I could still get angry, just like the next man, but out of control. It's no longer like I normally used to be. So when I saw this thing happen, I had to question the preaching. Pastors. You guys are not Jesus. You guys are not God. You are, no, you are not greater than anyone in your church. Your title gives you more responsibility. 
but it doesn't make you greater or better. Stop walking around like you know everything and cannot be corrected. Stop it. It doesn't make any sense. And this other thing, right? If, if, if God has given you a word to preach, why are you writing a sermon? I can't stand when pastors do that. You're going to sit up there and tell me that you got a word from God and this is what God told you, but you had to write it down. And then when you're reading it, you're stumbling over words and can't read what you wrote. I don't think God gave you that mess. It didn't even sound like him in the first place. It sounded like you trying to figure some stuff out. You understand? But if you can't read your own writing, trust me, it did not come from God. It didn't. You understand? Stop the nonsense. Stop the nonsense. What do we call that? Peacocking? Posing? You know what I mean? No cap, brother. But it's all cap, if you understand that term. Hey, I could use that term and not cuss. <laughs> yeah, it's all cap, bruh. <laughs> but, you know, seriously, man, come on, man. You pastors are something else. And then lastly... I'm going to say about my experience, right, is that you got four pastors at this particular church, and they all preach the same thing. And nobody wants to preach spiritual warfare. I call that a waste of time. How many times can you preach Jesus crucified to the same people before they get bored? You're, you're saying the same thing every Sunday. And the same things are being said every Sunday. Just different faces are saying the same things. Well, there's a lot more to learn in the Bible except for what y'all talking about. So, I'm going to stop here because I'm starting to, to, to splash over to those guys. I don't really want to talk about them uh, particularly, in particular because tons of other churches are exactly the same way as these guys are. But y'all got to know, man. Y'all need to be corrected. You know, I don't care how many hallelujahs thank you Jesus is and, and Jesus and, and I'm the righteousness of Jesus Christ and all this other garbage that comes out of your mouth, you need to be corrected. It is a sloppy agape. It is. Not necessarily agreeing with those people, but nah. Nah. <laughs> um, I'm glad I left. I'm glad I left. Right? And I'm happy for it. Uh, I'm not glad that I, I left who I left. You know what I mean? And if they're watching this, they'll understand that. But I'm glad I got out of that situation. I'm glad I walked away. You know? Because when, you, when, when, when all else fails, violence is not the answer, Deaconess. Violence is not the answer. I could have easily responded, but I chose not to while you called me a punk. You remember that going forward. Because you got to explain yourself to the Most High behind that. It felt good while you were doing it, but you got to explain yourself to the Most High. So with that said, um, I guess I'm out. Deuces. There's a horn do the do that ain't do. Express yourself.